Okay. Now we want to still incorporate the time. And one idea is how about looking at 3D convolutions? Treat time as if it's another dimension, like X and Y, your space. And what are the applications? You can have applications in search, recommendation, ranking. You can have action recognition. This one is my favorite, anomaly detection. For instance, you have a lot of cameras monitoring our roads every day. And uh, this could be useful for smart cities. And uh, maybe some drunk driver is driving on the wrong side of the road. And you want to be able to detect that from your cameras that are already mounted. So from infrastructure side of things, there is not much to change. The infrastructure is already there. It's just you have the data and being able to work with the data. The other one is activity understanding. What is this video doing? What is this person in this video doing, etc. You can do it for search. And as soon as you get the features out of your video, you can answer questions like this. How similar are these two videos together? And once you're able to answer that question, you can use that to rank your videos according to a search and then return the results. For instance, what videos are similar to this video that I'm watching? So let's recap what a 2D convolution does. You have a height and a width. You have a kernel of size k by k. And you're going to take that kernel and slide it over your image. That's going to give you your output of the convolution, 2D convolution. We saw this idea in the first paper. I think, uh, and what we were doing then was take as input all of your frames, all of your L frames for your time. And then the way that you're sliding this is you're sliding it only in 2D. Because as soon as you slide this window over your image, the third dimension, the time dimension, is just multiplying your input with this filter. And that's just a simple dot product and just averaging it. And that's going to give you the output of this convolution. You can have a 2D convolution on multiple frames. And we saw this in the first day. Another idea is to have 3D convolution. You have k by k, that's your filter size in space. And then you have another filter size in time, d. And then not only you are sliding it in 2D over your images, you are sliding it over the three dimension, the third dimension as well. So this is being slid all over the three dimensions. So is this clear? This has much less parameters compared to that one, assuming that you have the same L. This one has much more parameters. So these papers are not difficult. That's why I'm going through them faster than usual, because we have a strong background by now about convolutions. This is the entire macro structure of your 3D convolutional network, or convolutions and their pooling, convolution pooling, etc. In the end, are fully connected. And all of these convolutions that you're seeing are three by three by three. So K is three, this K is three, and D is three. Can I ask real quick? Um, so that means that each each kernel is essentially like each location as it's being slid across is looking at three frames in the time dimension. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And then yeah. at the same time, like that's still taking into account it will like it, there would be a third dimension that's taking into account the three different channels for RGB for a fourth dimension. Yes. So the RGB, you can think of it as uh, we can have three channels here. It could be a fourth dimension, but I cannot plot it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's very similar if you map your three dimensions. Let's say this is your pixel dimension, mm -hmm. is your L dimension. That could be your channel dimension, and it's all of your channels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And one other thing is uh, each point, you're right, is looking at three time steps or three previous frames. But as you keep stacking these convolutions on top of each other, then we know that its field of view is increasing, even in time. So the next one, if that one is also a three by three convolution, that one is gonna have a receptive field of five in time. So it's looking at five time frames. Okay, now let's look at some results. On every column is a different data set. We know about sports one million, we know about UCF, and these are some other data sets. There is one from UPenn. Uh, this row is different methods, and these are the results from those papers. These are the competitive state of the art at that time for that data set. 
and C3D is convolution of 3D is this paper. So it's lagging behind and it's probably because it has less parameters compared to a 2D convolution. And we know that sports 1 million is a huge data set, okay? So more parameters, a bigger data set is probably giving you better results here. But then for the smaller ones, you are getting pretty good results out of C3. This one is only looking at red, green, blue channel. And we learned from the previous paper that you can actually include optical flow, et cetera, some other features. And that's gonna improve your performance. Let's visualize some video clips. Let's take a network, a 2D network, trained on ImageNet, and let's take this C3D, and these are gonna be your feature extractors. So one is the method from this paper, the other one is a network trained on ImageNet. Now what you're gonna do is take each one of your clips and either push it through the network trained by ImageNet or trained by uh, 3D convolutions, and the data set that we are visualizing here is UCF101. And each color is a different class, is one of these 101 classes. So ImageNet could be your feature extractor or C3D could be your feature extractor. Each point is a clip in your data set. You can use TSNE to visualize it in 2D and we can see that C3D is able to separate these classes better compared to ImageNet. And let's compare it to the other stage of the art. C3D could be your feature extractor. You can have one network or multiple networks voting at the same time, and that's giving you this much accuracy. And if you include other features, it's going to give you 90% accuracy. And in terms of runtime, you can compare it with other methods. C3D is your benchmark, so its runtime is one, and the other ones are this much slower. And it's faster because convolutions are efficient both in terms of parameters and in terms of how you implement them. Okay, any questions?